Section 3.2 begins with us taking a look at an old example that we spent some time with in Section 3.1. But before we do that, notice the name of this section. We call it Straight Line Solutions. Now we've already kind of tipped our hat towards what a straight line solution is, but what does it really mean? I mean, you ever think about the, the word, or the phrase straight line, and the fact that it's sort of redundant to say a straight line, because if it's a line, of course it's straight. But what would a non-straight line look like? Well, actually, one of the things that's going to come up is in this section is, what do we mean by a straight line solution, and, and how could it be a non-straight line solution? We're going to talk more about that in a little bit. But right now, we're going to take a look at our old uh, system from last time. And we're going to remember that the Y, in this case, here and here, that thing is really a matrix. And that's why it's capital and bold face like that. And this matrix is really the values for x and y that we're used to seeing when we think about a phase plane or a system of differential equations. So over here, this is really saying the derivative of x with respect to time and the derivative of y with respect to time is equal to this coefficient matrix times this uh, matrix right here. And if you multiply this coefficient matrix by that guy right there, you will get a system of two differential equations, the top of which being dx dt and the bottom of which being dy dt. So just as a refresher, remember that this guy right here, that's the thing that we call the coefficient matrix. And by multiplying that coefficient matrix by this matrix that we already know, kind of column vector, we wind up producing a system of differential equations which is equivalent to this matrix equation with dx dt equal to 2 times x plus 3 times y and the bottom would be dy dt and that's going to be equal to 0 times x minus 4 times y. So this would be a system of equations that looks like this. Now notice, you, you can see where that coefficient matrix comes from. We know that it's really just the parameters. The coefficient matrix comes from these values right here, right? And that's where we get our coefficient matrix from. So all of this is kind of review-y stuff, but what does that mean about the system's phase portrait, or phase plane for that matter? It means that it, we know everything we need to know about this system of equations by just knowing those four numbers. Because whatever we call the variables, whether it's x and y, or y and v, or a and b, or Fred and George, it doesn't matter. Those four numbers, those four uh, values in the coefficient matrix determine everything about the phase plane. And so if you take a look at this thing's phase portrait, you'll notice I've kind of created a little phase portrait in matrix or in uh, maple. And specifically, I'm paying attention to two particular solutions. There's one right here that runs kind of diagonal like that. And you can see it follows along the um, those vector field lines, right? Those arrows. And it seems that everything that these two this solution is headed towards the origin. It's headed inward towards the origin. Right? But the other solution, the other, I guess you could call it curve, is this guy right here, and that's pointing in the opposite direction. Those arrows are kind of pushing it along outward this way and outward that way. And so if we call this one, we call this, this guy right here, we call this y1, and I'll use my, my marker here to make it nice and big, y1. That's y1 of t. That is a particular solution. And the other one right here, we'll call this one, let's go right here, we'll call this y2 of t. And it's worth noting that y1 and y2 are particular solutions, right? And these two guys right here, these are straight line solutions, abbreviated SLS. Probably should have put that up top, but straight line solutions. And these uh, are particular solutions of the system. And what's interesting is because we can kind of follow these, and, and this one 
clearly is headed towards the origin, and this one's headed away from the origin. If you look at any other point on the phase plane, if you plop your pencil down any place else, you can tell, like say for right there, if you were to draw what direction is it going, well it's going to be going in this direction at that place, and you can kind of imagine what the curve would look like. It would kind of sweep this way. In other words, it's affected by the blue straight line solution because it's headed sort of in that direction, but it's also affected by this one, so it's headed kind of in that direction. So what you wind up with is a curve that kind of follows both of those straight line solutions, but in the end, every curve, every solution curve for the system is always tangent to the direction field. And so what this is saying is our solutions, our solution curves, always follow the arrows on the phase plane. Right? They don't have a choice. They have to follow those. And so what you might notice are a couple of things that are really interesting about this. The first of which is this guy def definitely looks like a line and its equation, if you had to guess, it's going to have a negative slope and it's probably something like y equals, I don't know, maybe like negative 2x or something like that. And this guy right here, this is a straight line, and that's just the x-axis. So that, that actually has an equation that's knowable. That's the equation y equals 0. The other one down here, you might guess and say, I don't know, maybe this is something like y equals negative 2x. Those are the lines, if you were just given a graph of this and this, and you were asked to come up with the equation for those lines, those are the lines that they appear to be following. But every other solution curve on the phase plane is not a line. Every other solution curve is going to be a curve, right? So all other, um, I will say initial conditions, all other solution curves, there we go, for this system are curves, not lines. Everything else other than y1 and y2. So I'll say other than y1 and y2. All other solution curves are curves, not lines. Those are the only two that are lines. And the other thing to keep in mind, and that's kind of what I was suggesting at over here, is that these two are particular solutions, but every other solution curve seems to be kind of a mixture of those two. All other solution curves, oops, solution curves are a mixture of y1 and y2. And that's what makes them so useful as straight line solutions. And that's why this whole section is important for us, because we're going to be figuring out if there's a way we can find the equation for this and the equation for this, then we've essentially found a way to come up with an equation for every, or I should say any, solution for my system. In other words, if there's a way we can find those two straight line solutions, then we have a ticket to being able to find the general solution for this system. And that's kind of useful, that's kind of helpful for us. Now, <clears throat> as you might guess, looking at this thing right here, this is already a system that we know how to solve. So I'm gonna, just going to make a little note up here and point out the fact that this is, this is a partially decoupled system. Right, because we know that dy dt is only dependent on y. So we could actually solve this, plug that back in here, and then solve my uh, dx dt equation. So we have a method for solving it. And as is usually the case in mathematics, you build from the way you already know how to solve, you try to build another method for solving. And that's what we're going to do and try to put that together. So down on the bottom uh, of this page, if you look at the solution on the, on the x-axis, Right, that is the, the pink one up there. If x is greater than 0, the solution tends towards uh, 
positive infinity. It's heading out in that direction. And if x is less than 0, if it's to the left of the origin, the solution tends toward negative infinity. So you can see that pretty clearly. And then the other one, this one, I'll, I'll just call it the oblique solution. right? That's the one that we, call, uh, we shaded in blue up there. That oblique solution, well, all the initial conditions on that line, no matter where you start, all roads lead directly to the origin. So it doesn't matter what your initial conditions are. All initial conditions on that line head toward the origin as t approaches infinity. Right? So no matter what, now, I should say, the initial conditions don't approach the origin. The initial conditions are just the starting point. But if you start here, if you start here, if you start there, it doesn't matter. As, you, as soon as you play the clock forward, your solution curve is going to go whoop and head towards the origin. So that gets us through the first page, and it kind of introduces this idea of the connection between things that we already ha have seen before and things that we already know how to solve plus this extra weirdness of what's going on with this straight line solution here and here. The only other thing I wanted to show you real briefly is in Maple. So hold on, let me switch over to that. Well, my Maple's not working for me right at the moment, but we'll leave that um, for next time. So this is a good, good place to stop just for this first video. It gets us a little bit of a review and gives us a sense of where we're headed. We want to figure out those two straight line solutions so that we can put them together to come up with a general solution for any initial condition on the plane, not just the ones that are on the straight line solutions, but anywhere. And that's it for now.